Nathan W. Bingham, and welcome to Ask Ligonier. This month marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of Ligonier Ministries. August 1971 was when Dr. Sproul founded Ligonier. And as I'm sure many of you know, one of the highlights of those early years was those in-person Q&A sessions that Dr. Sproul would hold there at the Ligonier Valley Study Center. And today, thanks to the Ask Ligonier chat service, we're still answering your biblical and theological questions. We're answering hundreds of questions every single day from people all around the world. And tonight, we're going to answer some more of those questions. And so we've returned to the West Coast tonight, and we've invited back an in-person audience with us uh, and a special guest to answer those questions. And so tonight, I want to welcome the chairman of Ligonier Ministries. He's also one of our teaching fellows. He's President Emeritus and Professor Emeritus of Church History at Westminster Seminary, California, Dr. W. Robert Godfrey. Dr. Godfrey, thank you for coming back. Great to be with you, Nathan. Always a roller coaster. A roller coaster. Not a pleasure? Oh, yes. Very pleasurable when I know the answers. Well, if you have a question or would like to try and stump Dr. Godfrey tonight, make sure you use the hashtag AskLigonier on Twitter. Uh, send us a message on the Ligonier Ministries Facebook page, or just leave a comment wherever you happen to be watching the live stream tonight. Well, Dr. Godfrey, as I was thinking about this evening, I was thinking about the last time we were here on the West Coast. So this is February 2020. Uh, we were here live. We were on the Westminster Seminary, uh, California campus. We also had an audience for the first time. And then only a few short weeks later, everything changed, shutdowns happened. So I, I don't know if that speaks to the power of hosting a live event with you. I'm not going to comment on that. Um, but everything did, everything did change uh, after. You don't want to be known as Nathan the Plague? No, no, okay. I do not want to be known by that. Okay. Uh, but everything has changed. Uh, w as a Christian, what gives you hope as you live the Christian life in what is a rapidly changing world? Well, I suppose um, the wonderful words of Paul in, in Philippians, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. And uh, it has come home to me that uh, there are so many people in this world who have nothing beyond this world and therefore cling to it with a ferociousness that is alarming in many circumstances and leaves them open to believe the lie. Uh, one of the things that has always struck me in reading the Psalms is how frequently the psalmist talks about the problem of the lie or of liars. And I remember when I was younger, I thought, you know, isn't that kind of overblown, you know? But um, it, it has really come home to me that we are awash in lies of one sort or another. And of course, the devil doesn't really care which lie we believe as long as we don't believe the truth. And it, the, these months have very much brought home to me how crucial the work of Ligonier is to take the truth to people and to answer questions. Uh, you should have chosen someone better, but uh, I'll do my best. Well, we want to turn to some of the questions. Lots of them have been coming in tonight. Just want to remind you, if you do have a question for Dr. Godfrey, send us a message on the Ligonier Ministries Facebook page. Use the Ask Ligonier hashtag or leave a comment wherever you're watching the live stream tonight. So we're going to begin, Dr. Godfrey, with a lightning round. I know you enjoy these. Um, I know it's no challenge for professors or pastors to answer questions with brevity, um, so I'm sure you're going to have great success in the lightning round. We want to try and keep the answers 60 seconds or less. So, you ready? Yes. Okay. All right. First, I successfully answered the first you question. Did. Okay. You did. Well done. Uh, first question, Joshua on Facebook is asking, when will Dr. Godfrey have a teaching series on the Dutch Reformation? I'm, I'm That's a question stunned. someone else needs to answer? Um, I, no, I would, I would love to do that. I, uh, you know, provisionally, you can go and read my book on Saving the Reformation on the Canons of Dort, but uh, th that would be an excellent uh, help, particularly to our benighted Presbyterian friends. Well, I'm sure someone has taken note of that. Yes, okay. I hope so. But that would be fun to do. For, for you to do and for a couple of people to watch? Yes. Okay. That, that's... That's what I said to Chris Larson when uh, he, I asked if he'd published my book on the Canons of Dort. He said, yes. I said, do you expect it to sell a lot? He said, oh, yes, tens of tens. So, you know. Well, next question. This is lightning round. So. And, and, and yeah. you know what Dutch people do? They buy one copy and pass it all around. So, um. 
Well, this question came in on Twitter. Uh, why do Christians worship on Sunday rather than Saturday? That's a great question, and uh, depending exactly on one's theology, you'd have different answers. I would answer to saying that that's what the apostles taught us to do, uh, to mark the resurrection of our Lord, and to mark that while all creation worked in hope of rest to come, in the resurrection of Christ we rest and then work in the light of that rest. So I believe it's an apostolic requirement that we worship on Sunday. Uh, Serena on Twitter asks, I'm new to Reformed theology. What is the best resource to help me, be, uh, to help me better understand the Puritans? Well, there are so many, it sort of takes your breath away. Um, uh, I, I remember J.I. Packer saying, the very best way to re understand the Puritans is to read the Westminster Confession of Faith that the Westminster Confession of Faith is a Puritan document. It was written by Puritans, and it is a marvelous summary of what uh, Puritans taught and what they thought was most important. And when you've graduated from that, you can read the larger catechism. I was waiting for that. Okay, yes. Uh, Hector on Facebook, uh, how do we know which laws in the Bible we're still bound to obey today? Well, the theologians historically have made a distinction between moral laws civil laws and ceremonial laws. Uh, the ceremonial laws bound Israel uh, for their worship at the temple. Civil laws bound the state of Israel for its administration of justice. And the moral laws bound Israel to the moral law of God. And so a, a helpful way of looking at any law in the Bible is to ask what category does it fit in. If it's part of the moral law, we're still bound to it. Tim, using the Ask Ligonier chat service, uh, how can ministers introduce psalm singing to a congregation? Well, you can avoid the way I do it, which is choosing psalms with impossible tunes. Um, I, I think the minister in preaching can help people come to recover the psalms and begin to appreciate the distinctive character of the psalms. And I think people, when they get to know the psalms, uh, love them more and more. It's all a matter of getting to know them and then being able to sing them to tunes that are uh, appropriate. Um, so, you know, recently, maybe partly because I'm old now, uh, in the night when I'm not sleeping well, to be able to sing psalms uh, from memory is just a, a, a wonderful blessing. Great is the Lord and full of kind compassion. And if someone wants to learn to love the psalms, that just might be a book and a teaching series. There is a, uh, a book and a, and a teaching series. It doesn't do the job as well as it could or should, but uh, it's a place to begin. Uh, this question from Twitter, what is the intermediate state? The intermediate state is the state of the soul after the death of the body and before the resurrection of the body. And uh, uh, wh where as a small number of, of uh, Christians have believed that the soul sleeps in the intermediate state. Almost all Christians have believed, rightly, I think, biblically, that the soul is conscious in heaven in the presence of the Lord, waiting the resurrection of the body. Uh, Cade on Twitter, does the blood of Jesus cover all and every sin? The blood of Jesus covers all and every sin of God's elect. It's a good lightning round answer. I'm not saying another word. Okay. Uh, Ajit on Facebook, I think that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, what makes a Christian distinctly Protestant? Is it the doctrine of justification by faith alone, or is it something else? I would say what uh, most makes a Christian a Protestant uh, is the issue, in the first place, of authority. Where do we look for authoritative truth to guide us as Christians? And Protestants believe it's in the Bible. It's uh, the, the Bible alone, sola scriptura, as the, the um, uh, formal principle of the Reformation. And uh, I think that is uh, crucial, especially in our day, where there's so many doubts about the Bible. But when one accepts the authority of the Bible, one will then find the doctrines of grace alone and faith alone uh, clearly taught there. Uh, Laurie on Facebook. Why does the Apostle Paul motivate Christians with the promise of rewards in heaven? Isn't Christ our reward? Uh, Christ is our reward, but um, the, the Bible makes clear that uh, those whom the Lord uses uh, to a greater extent and are more faithful in His service 
will be appreciated for that. And Calvin talks about that in, just, in an interesting way, uh, saying that God doesn't really reward us. He rewards his gifts in us. And I think that's nice. Uh, this question from Facebook. Uh, my son struggles with the idea that people who are basically good still go to hell if they don't trust in Jesus. How can I help him understand God's justice? Well, if, if the issue is the justice of God relative to hell, then I think the issue has to be to really think about what is the state of mankind uh, fallen into sin? What is the nature of sin? And I think uh, one of the confusions there is that often we confuse niceness to one another with goodness, and that goodness in the first place ought to be uh, thought of in terms of our relationship to God. Uh, do we care about God? Do we serve God? And uh, if we don't, we really can't be basically good. Uh, which figure from church history do you think of most often today, and why? Well, three immediately come to mind. Uh, I think in a lot of ways probably the real answer is John Calvin, but secondarily Abraham Kuyper, because in the cultural confusion in which we find ourselves today, I find Kuyper's thought particularly helpful. And then uh, Amy Semple McPherson, just because she's fun. Okay, this question from YouTube. I'm not going to comment on Amy. Uh, but this comment from uh, YouTube. As a team, how can I stay focused on Christ and grow spiritually mature? I think as a team, um, it is crucial to fellowship in the Christian community. I think one of the temptations today, perhaps particularly because of social media, from where this question may have come, um, I think social media is very isolating uh, and individualizing, and teens particular, particularly need the fellowship of the Christian community, and particularly the fellowship of older people in the Christian community. So go to church and uh, ask your church to have study sessions where there are mixed ages, not segregated ages. Uh, we'll make this the last question for the lightning round. I know you can take a deep breath, but this from uh, the Ask Ligonier chat service. How can I help my friend understand the cessationist position referring to spiritual gifts? Well, that's maybe not a lightning round kind of question, but I, I would say take your friend to Hebrews chapter 2 at the beginning and notice there that uh, Hebrews 2 talks about how God bore witness through miracles to Jesus and to the apostles and how the um, letter to the Hebrews at the beginning of chapter 2 already seems to see that in the past. And I think it's particularly through seeing miracles as testifying to the authenticity of Jesus and the apostles in a foundational sense for the life of the church that uh, the cessationist position begins to make sense. Well, if I had a bell, I'd ring it now and say lightning round over. But if you have a question for Dr. Godfrey tonight, don't forget to uh, leave a comment uh, wherever you're watching the live stream on YouTube. Uh, use the hashtag Ask Ligonier on Twitter or send us a direct message uh, on the Ligonier Ministries Facebook page. And if you haven't already, I'd also like to encourage you to subscribe to the Ask Ligonier podcast. Uh, every week we release another episode and we put one of your questions to a special guest like Dr. Godfrey uh, and we release that uh, for free wherever you listen to podcasts. In fact, before uh, tonight's live event, Dr. Godfrey answered several questions that will feature in episodes in the coming weeks and months. Uh, so make sure you search for Ask Ligonier wherever you listen to podcasts, and there you'll also find details about how you can call in, leave a voicemail, and perhaps your question will be featured and answered on an upcoming episode. Okay, well, you can take your time in answering these questions uh, now, but we have a question from Joy. Uh, she's asking this on Facebook. Here we go. What can we learn from the ministry of Amy Semple McPherson? She just comes up naturally, doesn't yeah. she? Um, well, I think uh, what we can learn from the ministry of Amy Semple McPherson on the more negative side is the uh, tendency of American evangelicalism to seek out ever greater forms of excitement to try to move people towards Christ and to, uh, to learn the lesson that ultimately excitement is not what's going to bring people to Christ and keep them in Christ. 
Um, on the positive side, I think uh, Amy Semple McPherson understood the importance of communication, the importance of uh, using modern technology uh, to communicate. And uh, while at times she may have done that in a way I wouldn't have entirely approved of, her, her passion to get the message of the gospel out and her sensitivity to the times in which we live, I think really should continue to, to inspire us. Uh, she wasn't a perfect person, um, but then that's true of all persons in Christian ministry. And um, um, I, think, I think her passion um, should inspire us and uh, should, should lead us to be determined to be modern cr Christians. My wife always said to me that if the 16th century ever came back, I would be ready. And it's true, um, but the 16th century is not coming back. Um, the 20th century is not coming back. And uh, God calls us to live in our own time. And we may grumble about our times. We may legitimately criticize our own times. But our calling is to, to minister the truth of Christ to our time. And uh, uh, I think uh, that's an important lesson to learn. So when you bring up the negative aspect um, of using excitement to try and draw people to, to Christ, how do we see that played out in the church today, the 21st century church? Well, I think the, the great shift that took place in the latter part of the uh, 20, 20th century was very much in music, where the determination was that we want to leave old-fashioned, and to be sure, that meant largely 19th century music behind, and we wanted to go with the times to connect with contemporary people and therefore use contemporary music um, to do that, and that that music would be more exciting, more engaging. Uh, and I have a friend who said some studies have suggested that rather, being the, rather than being the door into the church, contemporary music has been the door out of the church. It's an interesting thing to think about and, and investigate. Um, and it is certainly true that in much of the 20th century, the church sang some pretty bad 19th century music. So um, w we shouldn't weep too much over the demise of that. But the problem with a lot of exciting contemporary music became that it was, was repetitive and, and shallow and didn't uh, really measure up to the profundity, for example, of the Psalms. And um, even if you're not an exclusive psalm singer, I don't know about you, but uh, even if you're not an exclusive psalm singer, the psalms sh certainly should be the model of what God wants us to sing. And, and the psalms uh, are profound. They're deep. They're carefully constructed. They're beautifully po uh, beautiful poetry. They connect to us in all sorts of ways. And um, uh, we, we ought to pursue that. Uh, the... Uh, the end of Hebrews 12 talks about how we are to worship God with reverence and with awe, and we have to think very carefully about r what reverence and awe means in the contemporary setting in which we find ourselves. John on Twitter is asking, what is the difference between heresy and apostasy? Have we seen new examples of each in the 21st century, or are we dealing with the same issues from previous eras? Well, heresy historically was defined by the church as the, um, a, a false teaching, which is so false that it deprives one of salvation. And the distinction then is usually made between heresy as soul damning and error, which may be problematic, but is not a heresy. And then heresy is also sometimes compared with schism, uh, division in the church, and the uh, historic uh, definition was that heresy was a sin against truth and schism was the sin against love. Um, and that, again, the, the conviction of the ancient church certainly was both were damning. Um, I've not thought so much about the relationship of heresy to apostasy, since apostasy is a falling away uh, and a falling away probably from both the church, and therefore a sin against love, and from uh, heresy, which is a sin against truth. So uh, apostasy is really turning away from the whole of Christian reality. 
both its truth and its love and its unity in Christ. And uh, yeah. This question from Facebook. Uh, there are so many theological positions concerning election, atonement, regeneration, and so on. How do I know the gospel I have believed is actually the true gospel? I, I think that's a great question, and I understand in a world of hundreds and hundreds of denominations that people can begin to, to wonder. And I've known over the years now a number of people who have become Roman Catholics, I think in part because they are just worn out with the sense of burden uh, to figure out what truth is. And there's something then sort of restful to say, well, it's really up to the pr priest and the bishop and the pope to figure out what truth is, and I'll just follow them. Uh, I understand that emotional appeal of Rome, but I think it's profoundly wrong. And I think you, you see the profound wrongness of it. For example, in Peter's first letter, uh, and after all, that should have special importance for Roman Catholics, it seems to me. Um, where Peter clearly speaks to the whole Christian community to, who, to whom he's writing and expects them to figure out truth from what he's writing. Uh, and uh, he, he nowhere says, just follow your bishop and your soul will be saved. He says, you need to know the truth. You need to follow the truth. You have a personal responsibility about that. And the word of encouragement I would have at the risk of being accused of being naive, the, the word of encouragement would, I would have is, if you really study the Bible, the truth about predestination, about atonement, about um, the grace of God, about justification, I believe really comes through clearly. Um, those who, who reject predestination are rejecting what's clearly there in the scripture. And they may have all sorts of uh, textual gymnastics that they go through to try to avoid the plain meaning of the text. Uh, but I think an honest person would have to say, you know, what, what Paul says in Ephesians 2, what Paul says in Romans 9, what Jesus says in John 6, these are really pretty clear. And uh, th the problem is not that we don't understand them. The problem is we don't want to believe them. And so I, w I would encourage those who are struggling uh, to find a church that really believes the Bible and encourages you to study the Bible. Now, that doesn't mean we easily agree about everything. There will be some issues, uh, but those are almost always secondary issues. Uh, the great issues of the gospel, I think, are plain in the scriptures. This question from Facebook. I am a high schooler. It's just very encouraging to see uh, a number of high schoolers uh, writing Indeed. in. But I'm a high schooler with unbelieving parents and unbelieving classmates. What advice would you give me as I seek to live for the Lord? Well, I would say in the first place that, that you've touched on the very heart of things, live for the Lord. Uh, let them see your life is different. And, um, and I would say, uh, I, I've said this to uh, parents who had trouble with children, uh, no one was ever nagged into the kingdom of heaven. And so um, bearing witness to your parents is also a matter of um, not being obnoxious, but being open to opportunities to speak about the Lord. Um, I, I think one good way of trying to do that is to talk as naturally as one can about what the Lord means to me, what the Lord's done for me, what I'm experiencing in my life uh, before the Lord so that uh, you're not sort of confronting them. There may be times for confrontation, but you're uh, talking about your experience, and in this postmodern world where experience is everything, what can they say to that? Uh, but you're, you're opening an opportunity for them to ask questions. And I think very frequently what we find is that when the Spirit is opening hearts, he leads people to ask questions. So uh, I would be patient, I would pray, that's crucial because it's the Lord that has to open hearts and then to look for opportunities to speak, but to lay a foundation of godly living before them um, as you go along. This comment on YouTube, 
Uh, why does the Bible warn Christians to, be, uh, to beware of false teaching if it is not possible for the elect to fall away? That's a good question, and it, it brings us back to the, uh, to the point the Reformed often want to make, namely that God uses means to accomplish his ends. So um, God uses preachers uh, to build us up in the faith. You could say, well, if the Bible's clear, if, if I'm a Christian and can read the Bible on my own, why do I need the church? Well, I need it because I'm not all sufficient by myself. And um, I need warnings. I need encouragement, I need uh, promises, I need direction, and all of those things are to be found in the Bible. All of them are to be found uh, in good preaching, in good Christian fellowship. And so uh, God, God uses other Christians, God uses the Bible, God uses good Christian books to uh, keep us on the right path. And uh, the, the sad reality is the continuing sin in our lives means we are prone to wander and um, we need all the help we can get. I mentioned earlier tonight uh, that the world has changed a lot since the last time we sat down together doing one of these live events. Uh, and it's led some Christians, as have observed just how significantly the world has changed. Uh, is, this, is this the beginning of the end? Is the, the Lord gonna return in any moment? Um, when you consider those people, and as, particularly as a church historian, can you answer the question, are we living in the last days? Yes, we are living in the last days. John, in his first epistle, said we are living in the last days. So the last days are the days from the ascension of Christ to his glorious return. So we are definitely in the last days. How close we are to the end of the last days is what people really want to know, and uh, I can't tell them. Um, what, what I can tell them as a historian is Whenever in the last 2,000 years Christians have found themselves in times of distress, of famine, of war, of cultural change, of collapse, of uh, rampant immorality, of depression, they've been convinced they're at the very end. Um, sometime one of them will be right, and uh, we will be at the very end. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, the Lord calls us to behave like Millerites. Do you remember the Millerites? I do not. I'm the sorry. Millerites uh, followed a farmer in western New York in the early part of the 19th century who said, the Lord is returning any minute and uh, sell all your possessions and go and sit on the top of your roofs and wait. And there were people who did that. And um, it led to what is known in church history as the great disappointment. Um, the Lord did not return. And I don't think the Lord calls us to wait in that way. He calls us to wait in faith, working for him until the last moment. There's the great story, regrettably probably apocryphal, uh, where Luther was asked, what would you do today if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow? And Luther is, it's claimed, said, I'd plant an apple tree today. Uh, Luther probably didn't really say that, but it's very much of the spirit of Luther. That's what he might well have said. Uh, we live our life until the Lord returns. We'll be surprised when he returns. He told us that. And what he wants us to be is faithful until he returns in all the callings to which we're called in this life. And so um, uh, things are uh, traumatic and difficult right now in a, a whole series of ways. But uh, um, the Lord calls us to be patient and faithful. Well, if you'd like to study the book of Revelation with Dr. Godfrey, uh, I would encourage you to visit ask.ligonier.org slash offer, and there you can request your free download of his 24-part series going through the book of Revelation titled Blessed Hope. Uh, so that's ask.ligonier.org slash offer. And that's our way of just saying thank you for joining us live, for submitting those questions. Don't go right now. We've still got a lot more questions to get to, but when we're over, visit that web address and request your free download. This is available to you for a limited time, uh, so request it, and then you can own it in your Ligonier Learning Library forever, or at least until the Lord returns. Um, if you'd and if you'd really rather buy it so that I won't starve in my old age, that, that would be all right too, wouldn't it? That would, that would be perfectly acceptable. Okay.
Um, I'm I'll, just kidding. I'll remind you of that web address again later this evening. All right, next question, Dr. Yes, Godfrey. Uh, Matthew on Facebook is asking, how do I better equip myself to teach others when I don't have a theology degree? Well, President Kim of Westminster Seminary, California would be very critical of me if I didn't say, get a theology degree. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to find a good seminary, there's one right here in Escondido, California, um, where you can study. If that's an option for you, it's, it's really worth uh, pursuing. But um, God uses many lay people uh, who work to learn the Bible, who read to learn theology and become reliable teachers uh, by self-study. Um, you know, one of the advantages of seminary is you can study Greek and Hebrew, which really are a help in studying the Bible. They're not absolutely necessary, but they are a, a real help, and uh, the church needs people who know Greek and Hebrew. But um, if you study your English Bible faithfully, if you read your Westminster Confession and your Canons of Dort and Calvin's Institutes, you can become a very helpful teacher uh, to many people by, by hard work. And Ligonier provides so many wonderful resources uh, to help people study. Um, you still sell books, don't you? We do. Uh, um, so, so buy some Ligonier books uh, to study, but also online, whatever exactly that is. There's so many things now available on the web. Aren't, isn't Ligonier about to roll out a new website? It's, it's live right now. It's live a right new now. New Ligonier.org, yes. Yeah. So making it much easier for people to find materials to study. And speaking of online, even uh, Reformation Bible College, if they're not wanting a seminary degree, but want an undergraduate degree, Absolutely, Reformation yes. Bible College now has online programs as well. Uh, ReformationBibleCollege.org slash online. Um, we did not set up any of these questions, but I appreciate the opportunities to, to remind you of these things. All right, next question. Uh, someone on Facebook is asking, what does the whole counsel of God mean? Well, the whole counsel of God refers to God's counsels of eternity, that God uh, from eternity has planned all things to come to be. He, he knows the end from the beginning. He, uh, he knows what he intends to accomplish, and he has revealed that um, in the scriptures. And uh, Paul in uh, uh, Acts uh, 20 uh, assures the Ephesian Christians that he has uh, preached to them the whole counsel of God. Now, that obviously doesn't mean the whole mind of God. Uh, the infinite mind of God cannot be uh, preached by a finite preacher. But there, I think Paul means, I've, I've told you all the important things that God has revealed that you need to know for your salvation and for your service of him. So we can think of that phrase in a couple of different directions. But uh, uh, Paul, particularly in speaking to the Ephesian elders, is reminding us as Christians that we want to know the fullness of the revelation that is crucial for our lives and um, our, our knowing the truth of God and that we need preachers who will bring that to us. That's why we need preachers who don't just ride hobbies or just don't preach in a scattershot way here or there, but help us really to grasp the fullness of what God has revealed. And that means often uh, preaching in an expository way through the book of the Bible uh, but contrary to some of my Presbyterian friends, I would say it, it also is very useful then to preach through a catechism, particularly a good catechism, like the Heidelberg Catechism, that uh, takes us from topic to topic in the fullness of what God has revealed and uh, reminds the congregation of those things. I mean, you can preach many books of the Bible, never get to the Lord's Supper, for example. But the Lord's Supper is very important for Christians. So. Um, ministers need to figure out strategies for bringing the whole counsel of God uh, to bear in their preaching and teaching. Uh, Paul on Facebook, how did the Puritan colony of Plymouth Rock influence Christianity in colonial New England? I thought it was the apostle that had emailed in. I was uh, uh, expecting to be corrected. Um, uh, the Plymouth colony was a a colony of strict Puritans who had separated from the Church of England. And um, so they were uh, non-conforming, separating P 
Puritans. So they did not conform to the practice of the Church of England and had separated from the Church of England. And actually, that um, colony was less influential than the larger New England Puritan colonies, which were non-conforming but non-separating. You don't want to take notes on this? Um, I'll watch it on YouTube. Okay. Um, so um, the, 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 the Plymouth colony grew rather slowly, uh, whereas the other Puritan colonies grew much more quickly because they had more um, support from England as legitimate colonies. And so uh, many of the, the big Puritan names that we think of from New England, um, uh, whether the Mathers or, or Jonathan Edwards, are more descended from those non-separating, uh, non-conforming uh, Puritans in New England. But the, the Plymouth colony uh, was an inspiration, I think, because of their their fervor and their commitment and their passion and their willingness to suffer uh, for uh, the offense of separating formally from the Church of England. This question on Facebook, uh, what era of church history is most similar to the church today? Now that's a good one. Um, I, would, I would say uh, we are uh, in a time machine moving backwards. So as I'm sure you thought immediately of the Emperor Theodosius in 380. I mean, that's what comes to mind with a question like that. And uh, uh, the Emperor Theodosius is the one who made Christianity the official religion of the empire. And one could say that from 380 on, all of Western history um, is lived out uh, in terms of Christianity being the dominant religion, and most often the legal religion, uh, until one could argue uh, early in the 21st century. So we are all uh, heirs of Theodosius in one sense or another until very, very recently. Um, and that what I would argue has happened in the last five to 10 years, I think it's that recently, we have moved back from 380 to 379. I think we are now in the pre-Theodosian, or of course what I really should say is post-Theodosian era. And therefore we are most like, I think as Christians today, the Christians who lived before uh, Theodosius. Um, and maybe particularly that period from 325 when uh, Constantine made Christianity legal, but not the only legal religion. Uh, from 325 to 380, Christianity was growing and prospering and developing, but still with um, opposition that was legal. And uh, I think we are now in a kind of world like that where there's a lot of turmoil and competition about what's true, what is going to dominate society. Uh, my fear is, of course, that instead of growing and becoming more and more successful, we're shrinking and becoming less and less successful and less and less influential. Um, but um, that means we're in more need than ever of learning what it is we need to believe. We can't just go with the crowd anymore because the crowd's going in the wrong direction. Now, many people would say the crowd's been going in the wrong direction for a long time. Um, and there's a certain amount of truth to that. But uh, it's really getting bad now. And um, people, you know, up until six years ago, most people in America, if we're talking primarily to America, um, most people in America at least felt some need to be a little bit polite about Christianity, even in rejecting it. Uh, now there's no need to be polite anymore, and Christianity is, is ridiculed um, and rejected by many. And I think uh, this is like the, the ancient church before uh, the days that persecution ended. And so I think studying the ancient church in a variety of ways can help us prepare for the shock. And I, I think that's what a lot of us as Christians are going through, the shock of suddenly living in a world 
that used to be polite to us and now is antagonistic to us. And um, um, we, we, need, we need to really know who we are to live in that world. This week, Ligonier Ministries uh, released an essay by you, a, a longer article titled uh, Courageous Calvinism. Uh, we also made it available as a booklet that people could download. Um, of course, I do encourage everybody to go to Ligonier.org and just type in Courageous Calvinism. It will it'll pop up and you can read it there. But for those that haven't read it, could you summarize what do you mean by Courageous Calvinism and why is that, uh, in your estimation, needed for the church today? Well, what I tried to do in that uh, essay that actually I wrote some 30 years ago and have updated for that, that bulletin, I, I wanted to say, uh, first of all, that Calvinism as an intellectual uh, uh, understanding of truth is biblical and right and helpful, but that the church today needs more than just the truth. It needs the community of faith. It needs the church as an institution. And that's a challenge for a lot of Americans who have, have grown up as rugged individualists. That's what Americans are good at. And there are many virtues to being an individualist, but there are also virtues to being part of a community. And uh, I think particularly in an increasingly hostile world, we need a community. We need a Calvinism that expresses itself not only in the truth that it teaches, but in the community it creates, which is a community of love as well as a community of truth, a community of discipline uh, as well as a community of support. And I think that's what we need and what Calvinism at its best provides in the best way. So um, get a copy of that and tell me what you think. Well, we're going to make this the, the last question before we go to another lightning round. So just preparing you for that. Uh, but this question from Eric on YouTube, he's asking, what should I say to a family member who claims to be a Christian but refuses to join a church? Well, again, I think uh, very often questions like that are, are really pastoral questions that need to be explored in context. And um, uh, so, you know, I need to know what, what the family member really believes and uh, what your relationship with the family member is. Uh, but, but I think a place to start would be um, to look, say, at Hebrews chapter 10, neglect not the gathering of yourselves together, as is the habit of some. Uh, why, why does the Bible warn us against not gathering together? Now, maybe this person does gather with a church, but just hasn't joined. Well, you could look in, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul talks about being members of one another. Now, that may not be always exactly strictly uh, membership role, but it talks about the organic unity of the church and the connectedness of the church. And you could look at passages in Scripture then about uh, uh, discipline. Uh, how does a church discipline someone who is not part of the church? And yet discipline is crucial to the life of the Christian community as we see at many points in, uh, in Scripture. So I would try to as opportunity arises, engage this family member in, in an examination of certain um, passages of Scripture that relate to this and, and determine, of course, why is this person not joining the church? Were they offended in some way? Were they uh, abused in some way? I mean, it's a good opportunity to begin to explore uh, the origins of this problem and, and uh, then be in a better position to know how to try to adjust, uh, address it. Okay, so this is second lightning round. It'll be the last lightning round. Um, so answers 60 seconds or less. Ready? Was I perfect in the first, never longer than 60? <clears throat> I, I, I don't feel know. like I rambled a little bit on no, some No, you did of good. Questions. All right. Yeah. That's, that's what I really wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so this I is would have preferred to hear that I did well, but doing good is okay. You did better than you have in the past. Well, Ooh. now I'm offended. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll try again. This okay. is your opportunity to do well. All right, thank okay. you. Okay. All right. This question on YouTube. Are you blushing? Maybe. Okay, good. I'm, I've been aiming you are at the that chairman, for a right? long time. Yes. Uh, this question on YouTube. Did Jesus need to learn and study the scriptures? Wow, this is a great lightning round question. Yes yeah. and no. 
I'll move on. In his divine nature, he did not. In his human nature, he did. And those natures, lest our Lutheran friends attack us, cohere in the person. And so the person of Jesus did have to study and learn. Uh, Ryan on Twitter, should Christians still fast? Some of us who are a little overweight should. Um, uh, Jesus gives directions about fasting, and therefore certainly there is a legitimacy to fasting, but we don't have a lot of specifics in the New Testament about, about when, how, how long to fast, and therefore I would say uh, Christians can fast. I'm not sure they must fast, uh, and uh, we should be very careful about laying down rules about fasting. Matthew on Facebook, who is your favorite Protestant reformer? Luther. Uh, uh, no, Calvin. But I like Luther as a close second. Okay. I was just reading some Luther, and Luther is always so wonderful. Can I do this? Yeah, or, you can yeah, do okay. This, yeah. um, just reading Luther in the table talk where he says uh, uh, that Satan is so arrogant, he always overlooks things. And so he misses anything down low. He can't look down low. And that's why. God sent little preachers to crawl around on the ground to preach because the devil can't even see him. So Luther is so quotable, but, but Calvin is so very uh, balanced, but passionate at the same time. Aaron on YouTube is asking, what book would you recommend on the subject of church worship? Uh, Mike Horton did a, a good book on, on church worship. Um, uh, John Meather and Daryl Hart did a good book on church worship. I keep meaning to write one. I recommend that very highly, but it's yet to be. It's not in print yet. It's not in print yet. It's not in print yet. But it's a very important subject. Uh, and part of the problem is there are so many good reform books on worship that are mainly theological and historical. And the book I want to write and will never get to is, so someone else can do this, um, it Show, would show the biblical foundations of Reformed worship. We don't create our worship just as a matter of history and theology, as important as those are, um, but, but John Calvin reformed the worship of the church because of what he found in the Bible, and we need a better book to make that clear, I think. This question from Twitter, what are the main differences between the Dutch Reformed tra tradition and Presbyterianism? The Dutch Reformed tradition is Dutch, and the Presbyterians are Scottish. Um, and um, actually, th the differences are not so great in terms of historic Scottish Presbyterianism and historic uh, Dutch Reformed Christianity. Um, the, the Presbyterians, for most of their history in Scotland, were battling the government whereas the Dutch Reformed got government support earlier. And that makes the Dutch a little nicer and the Scots a little more polemic. Um, I may be the first person to describe the Dutch as nicer. Um, uh, today, part of the difference is that the Dutch Reformed communities in America have been a little less Americanized than the Presbyterians in America. So the Presbyterians tend to be a little more influenced by uh, evangelicalism and Pentecostalism uh, in, in some quarters than are the Dutch. Uh, Nuda, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, on Facebook, they're asking, how do you help people who struggle with the doctrine of predestination? Um, I, I think the, the important way to, to do that is to study the scripture with them. And I've just been studying on my own um, Romans chapter 8 again, a, a great passage that we all know. And Romans chapter 8 is really written to help the Christians as they're struggling. You know, the, the suffering of this present time is not to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. That's what Paul is doing there. And part of the way he encourages Christians in their struggles uh, is to say to them, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, uh, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. And to help people see that predestination is the answer, not the question. Predestination is the comfort, not the doubt and the worry. That predestination says, 
God has taken hold of you and he'll never let go. That's what the doctrine of predestination um, is all about. And to help people see how comforting it is, is the real requirement. And LaVonda on Facebook is asking, what is your fondest memory of R.C. Sproul? Oh, there are so many. R.C. was so memorable. Uh, uh, but, but the one that comes immediately to life is, to, to mind is, is sitting in a panel answer, asking, answering questions. And uh, uh, one question was about, you know, how can I speak to my child about Christian things and uh, uh, especially about the sovereignty of God and R.C. looking at the, the huge audience, 5,000 people sitting there and saying, what's the matter with you people? Um, <laughs> sort of, you know, I've been teaching you all this time and you still come up with a question like that. And so you better be careful. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, but it, I, that, that leaves the impression, maybe, for people who didn't know R.C., that uh, he, he was sort of grumpy. There was almost nothing grumpy about R.C. He was so warm and positive and encouraging. Um, he was a splendid person. Sam on YouTube, what is apostolic succession? That's a great question. Um, one could say, in a sense, that the the difference between Roman Catholics and Protestants come down to the matter of apostolic succession. Rome claims that you can know its teaching is true because it possesses the apostolic succession of office. Its bishops follow one after another from the apostles, and the apostles promised apostolic succession in the office of the bishop to guarantee truth. And Protestants say uh, we are right because we have the apostolic succession of teaching, not of office, and that it is the apostles' teaching that guarantees the truth, not the apostolic office, and that the apostles never taught the apostolic succession of offices, but they did teach the apostolic succession of truth, which was to be preserved in the scriptures for us for all time. So we believe in the apostolic succession, but not of office, but of truth. Alyssa on YouTube is asking, what methods can help me memorize scripture? Well, I know uh, the Navigators are an organization that have given great time and energy to encouraging people to, nap, to uh, memorize the truth and materials to help them do that. Um, I, I admire people who can memorize the truth. My memory is very peculiar. I have a really good memory unless I have to memorize something word perfect, and then I find it very, very difficult. Uh, so um, go at it. But um, if you can't always memorize things word perfect, um, get it in mind the substance of the thing. That's maybe more important, and where to find it. Um, Last question for the lightning round. <sighs> Brian on Facebook is asking, why should all Christians, you, you love, the, these are really good questions for you. Uh, why should all Christians study church history? Um, it's comic relief from theology. Um, uh, it's, it's theology in action. It's theology in reality. Um, and, and church history always reminds us that people are not motivated exclusively by ideas. Um, that they are motivated by many factors. And church history helps us see why sometimes people fight over theology when they're really fighting over other things. And uh, so church history broadens us out and helps us see theology helpfully in context. Second lightning round done, and you did well. <sighs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I want to remind you, if you would like to request your free download of Dr. Godfrey's 24-part series, Walking Through the Book of Revelation, Blessed Hope, you can do that by visiting ask.ligonier.org slash offer. It's a limited time offer just to thank you for joining us live tonight uh, to request your free download of Blessed Hope by Dr. Godfrey. Okay, this question now from Facebook. Uh, how did the Reformers view Islam? The reformers had, especially the first, second generation of uh, reformers, 
had a little less immediate contact with Islam than uh, some of the ancient churches did that actually ended up bordering on Islam. Um, and uh, we know, for example, that Thomas Aquinas you know, wrote his Summa Contra Gentiles in large part as an apologetics against Islam. Um, uh, but they were aware of Islam, they were aware of the uh, challenge of Islam, and uh, Islam was a very real challenge. Uh, in the um, 16th and 17th century, Islam had uh, marched into Eastern Europe and conquered significant areas of Eastern Europe and actually would come to threaten the very gates of Vienna. Uh, so uh, Islam was not far away and the, <coughs> excuse me, the basic teaching of the reformers was the teaching of the medieval church as well, that Muhammad was a false prophet and that uh, uh, had been prophesied in scripture, some of them held, uh, in the book of the Revelation where the false prophet arises in, in uh, Revelation 13. And so uh, they saw it as a, uh, a dangerous um, competing religion um, some of the reform thought that uh, the uh, tendency of the Christian church to use images uh, had given Muhammad a leg up in criticizing Christian idolatry. So the reformed thought they were in a better position in a sense to refute Muhammad. But uh, yeah, that was the basic uh, element of, of Christian understanding, of, of the reformers early understanding of Islam. This question from Facebook. Uh, what is the difference between once saved, always saved, and the perseverance of the saints? Well, in the strictest sense, I think they, they mean the same thing. Um, namely, that uh, those whom God has saved, he will preserve and not allow to fall away. I, I think it is legitimate to ask, are those two ways of speaking uh, equally useful, and I, I think probably the question comes out of a fear that if you say once saved, always saved, it, it sounds like a carte blanche to go live any way you like. It sounds kind of antinomian. Uh, God is stuck with me now that I'm saved, so I can live the way I want, and he still has to save me. Um, I don't think that's probably what the original once saved, most of the original once saved, always saved people meant, but I, I can see how that's a concern and a potential danger. Whereas the perseverance of the saints uh, stresses that we live as saints perseveringly. We go on living as saints. We go on pursuing holiness and living by faith. And I think as a matter of Christian living, that's a more helpful way to think, uh, that we have to persevere. But we don't want to turn our responsibility to persevere into a works righteousness either. So. <coughs> Excuse me. We don't want always to link uh, our perseverance to our confidence in God's preservation. So perseverance and preservation are good to link and keep together. Well, it's going to be the second last question for tonight. So we're almost uh, coming to 60 minutes. Uh, but this question from YouTube, uh, do, uh, do, do predestination and free will contradict one another? It depends a little what you mean by that. Um, Augustine, early in his career, wrote a, a treatise called The Freedom of the Will, and he never retracted that, despite his strong teaching on predestination. And he never retracted that because when he talked about the freedom of the will, what he really meant was that you have a genuine will that genuinely operates according to the way you want it to operate. So in that sense, you could call that will free. It's a real will, it's a choosing will, and it has freedom to do what it wants. Um, the Reformed doctrine of total depravity is not that we don't have a functioning will, it's that we have a will that always acts in accordance with our fallen, depraved nature. So we always freely will against God until we're regenerated. Um, nonetheless, that's not what most people probably mean when they talk about the freedom of the will. Um, most people, when they use the phrase the freedom of the will, mean that I'm perfectly free to choose for God or against God. 
And in that sense, it conflicts with the doctrine of predestination. The doctrine of predestination, in, in response to that notion of the freedom of the will, wants to say, uh, you don't have freedom to choose for God because your will is in rebellion against God. And it's only when God heals your rebellion, it's only when God regenerates your heart, it's only when God sovereignly turns you back to himself that you can know him and pursue him. Well, as a final question for this evening, uh, we've talked several times about the times in which we're living right now. What counsel would you give to a Christian who is perhaps experiencing some heightened level of anxiety or fear uh, regarding a number of issues that I think really is a symptom of us being bombarded with so much information these days. But how do you counsel the Christian that uh, is, is perhaps struggling with anxiety uh, given the times that we're living in right now? I would say in terms of the big picture, always remember Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And when you look through history, uh, Christianity has survived and thrived under dictatorships, under persecution, under democracies, under monarchies, in every conce conceivable culture and political environment, Christianity has been able to survive and thrive because Christ will build his church. So don't get overly anxious. Um, and again, I would say, I think it's tremendously important for us to be part of a church, a local church. Um, to, to gather regularly and, and be encouraged uh, by the faith of others, um, and then to cultivate our own individual Christian life by prayer and Bible reading, so that uh, we are constantly, daily reminded that God is in charge. Uh, God knows the end from the beginning. God accomplishes all things according uh, to the counsel of his will for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So. Um, these are hard times, and it's not surprising that some folk are very anxious, but uh, God is in charge, and God will comfort us individually as bringing this world to his end. Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. Godfrey, for tonight. We're grateful for your time and for your answers. Thank you. It's a privilege to be with you and with all of those who are listening. And thank you for watching live tonight. I want to encourage you again to subscribe to Ask Ligonier, the podcast. Every week you can hear one of your biblical and theological questions answered by one of our special guests. So simply search for Ask Ligonier in your favorite podcast app and leave a review if you enjoy it. It's a great way to help other people discover the podcast. Well, I'm Nathan W. Bingham, and I look forward to seeing you next time. We survived. We did it. I did it.